Good morning, church. Please open your Bibles or you can follow along with the bulletin. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 14 through 36. I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation, Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 36. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Hello Jews, and all you residents of Jerusalem, let me explain this to you, and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. And it will be the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servant in those days, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and the sign of the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to the blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourself know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For believe it says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoice. Moreover, my flesh will rise in hope, because you will not abandon me in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the path of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the word of the God. Thank you, Riris, for reading. I think I could almost hear Peter this morning. Through your passion, it was, it was amazing. Let me, uh, let me pray for us before I start. Dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is this morning to, to stand before a congregation, Father, and to serve. Father, you are the one that delivers to us, Father, the word. And Father, I ask only as an instrument this morning that through me you will speak. Father, just as you spoke through Peter, Father, not his own words, but the words that your spirit spoke through him, Father, that both the words I speak through the Holy Spirit may be fruitful. And Father, that the ears that it reaches this morning, Father, may, may find place in each individual's heart this morning. Father, I need your help. 
and I ask you to lead me through, uh, through this sermon. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Since October, we've gone through to the book of Acts, the second book of Luke that he wrote. And today, what's playing off here is it's still in the situation, it's, we are still in the same day of Pentecost. And the result of what we see is what has happened and what was testified or what was told by Christ that would come. That when they were in the upper room, it was said that to them that they will receive the Holy Spirit. In Acts verse 1 verse 8 it says, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come to you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We have seen how the disciples, 120 together with all the others, were in the upper room waiting, following the instructions of Christ to wait. And then we saw on in, in chapter how they kept on going, how they went about to add Matthias to make it once again the twelfth. And while they were waiting in the upper room, when the Holy Spirit came to them in a sudden sound like a violent rushing wind, and when this room was filled and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they started to rejoice. They started to praise God. And they started doing it in different tongues and languages. And then we see a crowd which gathers together and in, in, in questions what, what is happening. And the beauty of that is that everyone started to hear the gospel in their own language. At the end of Matthew, when God gives the commission to the disciples, go and take the gospel to the ends of the world, I sometimes wonder if there wasn't a apostle who wanted to raise up his hand and say, God, I cannot speak all these languages. But God provided. That's why God told them to, Jesus told them to wait. And as I was going through the preparation of this, looking, what does it mean? This is exactly what we see at the end of, uh, or end of this passage in chapter 2 where it says they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But the some sneered and said to them, they were all drunk. And I think this was the reaction that Peter saw as an opportunity to get up and say, I will answer you. Let me tell you what it means. So we are still in the day of Pentecost. We see Peter getting up and Peter addressing the crowd. So for a moment, I want you to imagine Peter standing up, the mockery of the apostles, the 120 join him in the upper room. He was following the instructions to pray. I want you to imagine the confusion they heard when, when the Holy Spirit came from there. And then we see Peter getting up and he starts preaching bold, filled with the Holy Spirit. And also, if you imagine standing there and you recognize Peter, you will say, but is that not the same Peter who denied Christ three times the night he was arrested? That is the same Peter. What happened to him? The church that transformed Peter by the Holy Spirit gets up, raises his voice, and he proclaims the truth about Jesus Christ, the Lord and Messiah. Peter takes us through, through his sermon, he takes us through three points that he wants to highlight to us. The first point is, Jesus is the Messiah, and he fulfills the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord and Messiah, and he displays the power of God. 
in verses 22 to 32. And Jesus is Lord and Messiah, and He rules forever, verse 33 to 36. So it's only three points that we will be looking at. Verse 14 to 15. So Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and proclaimed to them, Fellow Jews and all your residents in Jerusalem, this, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So Peter stood up, raised his voice, almost heralding, while proclaiming the truth that he now understands so clearly. He addresses the Jews as well as the residents, meaning the Gentiles that was also staying in Jerusalem. But Peter does not spend a lot of time defending his apostles. He does not spend a lot of time debating about the drunkness that they are accused of. After all, they, uh, they would not believe him if they told him that the Holy, it was the Holy Spirit. After all, these are the ones that crucified Christ. The only thing Peter tells them is, it's only nine in the, in the morning. Who would be drunk this time of the morning? Rather than being concerned with the matter, he turns to them and says, listen, rather pay attention to my words. Peter immediately, should, immediately points them to the prophet Joel. And the passage that was spoken in Joel 2 verse 28. Why does Peter do that? Why not explain to them in his own words what this whole event is playing around? Well, first of all, Jesus did not reveal this to the crowd in the upper room. They would not understand. And they will continue to mock. Secondly, Peter follows the example that Christ showed when he was tempted by the devil in Luke. Now, we don't have to turn there, but I will just quickly page to that. First of all, in Luke 4, verse 3 to 4, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, Tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must not live by bread alone. The devil can, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8, verses 3. In Luke 4, verses 8, the devil then shows the, 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 the splendor and the authority that it will give him. And Jesus answered him, quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the third temptation, when the devil said he will give his angels a look at Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from there, for it is written. And the devil tries the same trick. He will give his angels orders concerning you to, to protect you. They will support with your hands so that you, that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. It is, said, is it not said, Do not test the Lord your God. Why did the devil not pursue any further? Because it was a lost case. Because of Jesus replied, it is written and it is said. So Peter follows the same example, then quoting the scripture. In theology study, there are two things that we always need to keep in mind is when we state something, we also need to be able to prove it. And how we prove it is through scripture. This is the example that Christ said, and this is also the same pattern you will see when Peter explains this that all was spoken. So Peter uses this passage from Joel, verse 17 to 21. And it will be in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old man will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my servants in those days, both men and women. And they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven, signs on the earth and earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great glorious day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the context of Joel, the prophet spoke of judgment that has arrived in Judah, of the locust and of the trout. In Joel 2, he begins by describing the judgment that will come, a mighty army sent against Judah. Since this is part of the day, God's day and not man's day, it is described as the day is the Lord. But because they heard the warning of judgment, God's people repented. It doesn't make their repentance less valid because they had to be scared into it. The important thing is that they turned back to God in sincerity. Judah could now, could now what the Lord, when God's people sincerely repent, he notices from heaven. His zeal and his pity turns towards his people. Joe looked forward to the restoration that God promised. And he told Judah to look forward in faith and to praise God for the restoration he promised, even before they saw it with their own eyes. After the restoration, Joel spoke of previously in the chapter, there will, be, there will come a time of ultimate restoration and blessing. This time will be marked by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on all flesh. Not only on selected men, of status or of rank, but on all to do be poured out. So here Joel looked forward to the glorious new covenant when the Spirit of the Lord will be poured out on all flesh. The year this that Peter is speaking now is living in these days. They will see the signs and wonders by God through the power of the Holy Spirit that works through those who believe. God's final act of salvation has begun to take place. Judgment is for sure to come, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In today's world, we often find ourselves adrift. It is the news articles, reliable or not. Is the photo accurate or has it been altered? Did this really happen? Were the persons who taken this, did they take it out of context? Is something true or not? For that matter, what is truth? And does it even matter? Is there truth in my truth or in your truth? No, there's only God's truth. The truth is whatever corresponds to his character. Well, then, that, while that might not help us to decide what a person says is true or false. We have a solid foundation upon which to base our lives, which says that we are not adrift of a sea of uncertainty, but we have the scripture to guide us. So let's take one step back and ask the question, why is this truth really important? Why is it so important that Peter states the fact and then he proves it through scripture? Well, for the obvious reasons that every truth has a consequence. This is precisely what happens when we proclaim the truth of Jesus, Lord, Messiah, to someone. We proclaim it to someone who's asking, what does this really matter? What does it really mean? Uh, we do not make uh, up stories, add or remove any detail because it is written. When we fully put our trust in God, as Peter did when he quoted the prophet Joel, we will not fail. We cannot ignore the fact that there are, we are in the last days, you and me. And for those who believe upon the Lord, we will be saved. Those who have not repented 
those who stand in the crowd, those who sneer to those who really ask the question, what does it mean? If they do not hear the word, they will experience the judgment. The only way that we reach them is when we stand up like Peter, bold and full of courage, and praying that God through his spirit will give us the power to proclaim the glorious truth of both Jesus being Lord and Messiah. It is also so important that that we learn to memorize scripture. The foundation that we keep inside when we get into these situations, where we get to the point where we, where we state and we prove the truth of scripture. We have to believe the promise that Jesus gave to his apostles that he will ask the Father, who Jesus is, is, is sitting next to, to, to send us a helper and to help us to proclaim the, the glories of, of God, just as it was proclaimed in, in the upper room. In the second part, we look at chapter 2, verse 22 to 32, where it says, Jesus displays the power of God. Jesus being the Messiah and the Lord displays the, displays the power of God. And we look at chapter, this verse 22 to 23. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. For Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him. Just as you yourself know, Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to the cross and kill him. Peter once again draws his attention to the crowd, and he's not finished it. But he addresses now the specific crowd, Israel. God, Yahweh himself, sent Jesus, as Peter announces Jesus as Nazareth, to accomplish his work on earth. And he mentions to them that you have seen the signs that he did among you, just as you self know. The son accomplished God's plan. God attested and made himself known through Jesus through the miracles in front of him, signifying the operation of God's power of kingly rule through Jesus. These wonders caused amazement in front of many witnesses and signs that pointed to the character of Jesus and the significance of his coming. Yet the Jews did not recognize Jesus as the man of God, and they crucified him. And so for a moment you can imagine the crowd that stood before uh, before Christ as he was being crucified, shouting crucify him continuously. It is this same crowd that is now silent. They had more, nothing more to shout. It's done. Jesus has been crucified and they got what they asked for. Ironically, they got something out of it but they did not know it yet. It was salvation. You see, without doubt, the emphasis is on God's sovereignty and power and everything that happened. Jesus was handed over by God's deliverance and for knowledge, for our good. In verse 24, Peter continues to say that God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. Even by dying on the cross, by those Peter was speaking to, Jesus fulfilled God's plan. God fulfilled his plan through these people who stood there. You see, the wages of sin is death. Jesus, being a sinless man, did not qualify for death, for he had no sin. The death 
could not hold him, and God knew that. Even putting Jesus to death, the Jews were fulfilling what God had already determined that must take place, and indeed had foretold it in the prophetic writings. The promise of the Messiah, a Savior that is what death brought forth. Jesus rises from the death as victorious over death, but also as the Savior from eternal death. Verse 25 to 28, Peter once again states his point by showing to Scripture. For he says, For David says to him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. And then Peter does it again. He supports his statement of Christ rising from the dead through Psalm 16, verse 8 to 11. David says this of him. So who could argue? Even when Peter referred to Joel, who could argue? The prophet Joel spoke the truth. He was a prophet. He was known through Old Testament. Even King David spoke of this. It also then mentioned in Acts, at the beginning of Acts already, where David prophesied about Judas. The psalm that Peter is referring to here is a prayer by a godly man who makes known that David was speaking here about the Messiah and not about himself. The one God did not abandon in Hades, whose flesh did not see decay. And Peter clarifies this to the crowd in verse 29 to 31, where he says, Brothers and sisters, I confidently speak to you about the Patriarch David, who is both dead and buried, and in his tomb is with us to this day. Since he has prophesied, he knew that God has sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing that it was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, the one who was abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. Peter clarifies to the crowd that David's reference was not to himself. And even Peter refers to that David is still in the tomb, in contrast with Christ's tomb that is empty. Jesus' resurrection was the ultimate accreditation and vindication as God's servant and Messiah. And Peter describes David seeing what was to come, the resurrection of the Messiah. Israel knew that the Messiah, the Anointed One, would come from David's rule. Peter once again then states the point, if the Messiah is the one that was expected to rise from the dead, Jesus that rose from the dead. Connecting the two together, who can deny that Jesus is the Messiah? In verse 32, Peter starts to draw to a conclusion. What has been prophesied is now fulfilled in Jesus. The Old Testament prophesies that the Messiah would rise from the dead. And seeing that he mentions witnessing to Jesus' resurrection here. So as Peter draws to, to the conclusion, it then takes us to the, the, the last part uh, of Peter's point, where if Jesus is the Lord and Messiah, this would mean that he rules forever. In verse 33, we see the following. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God, 
and has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both seen and hear. Peter reaches this point in the third point where he says, Jesus rules forever. How do we know? Well, Peter starts with the final point where he says, Therefore, since I have now explained to you through the prophecies written about the events to come, that this Jesus, the Messiah that you have crucified, is he that God has written from the dead, has planned. It is also he who has been exalted by God, ruling from the right hand of God. It is he who received the promise of the Holy Spirit, and he has poured out what you both see and hear, fulfilling the prophecy of Joel, and also brings in full circle everything to the beginning, to the reason why the Holy Spirit has been poured out, what the crowd experiences on this day. In verse 34 to 35, he moves to a close, affirming Jesus' rule from heaven. And once again, Peter quotes David's own words from Psalm 110, verse 1, where it says, The Lord declared to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Who can argue with this? To sit at the right hand of God was a privileged status. Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of God meant he had done what David could not. Remember, David is still in the tomb. To rule from every throne is one is the one whom David anticipated and who he addresses as the Lord, Jesus, Lord, and the Messiah. So Peter uses, in verse 36 then, the same as it, where he says, Therefore let the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So Pete, Peter uses these words, with certainty, almost as an assurance that it can no longer be denied. That although you did not believe and have rejected this Jesus so many times, it was always God's divine plan to make Jesus Lord and Messiah for the sake of our salvation. I read a story about uh, a young boy who stood outside in an art store looking intently to a painting with Jesus on the cross. And while he was looking, a man was passing by and he stood by the little boy and he said, asked the little boy, do you know who that is? And the boy answered him and said, yes, sir. That is Jesus, the Savior who died on the cross to save me. Those people around him are the soldiers who killed him. And that woman who's crying there is his mother. The man patted the boy on the head and he walked away. He didn't get far when he was fooled, but he was, uh, when he felt someone pulling on his sleeve. The same little fellow had spoken to him moments before said, Please, sir, I forgot to tell you. I forgot to tell you something else, even more important, that this Jesus you see there is not on the cross anymore. He's alive because he is risen and he's in heaven today. That youngster knew the living Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior, Messiah who died and rose for us. He knew the gospel and he was not afraid to share it. The climax of the gospel is the resurrection. Every sermon preached by the apostles included the, the news that Jesus is not dead. No matter how eloquent a sermon might be, 
It is not the gospel if, if it leaves Jesus on the cross in the tomb. A dead man can save no one. The world still has Jesus on the cross. The truth either denied or not clearly communicated to them. In fact, the world has no problem in taking Jesus off the cross. Because if they do so, they have to explain, which they cannot. What would happen next? God's command is clear. Go tell the world that the cross is empty. Jesus went to the grave. Go tell the world that the tomb is empty. The Messiah has risen. Go tell the world that the risen Jesus is now Lord of all and is ruling from heaven from the right hand of the Father. Do you personally know and boldly pro proclaim Jesus as Lord and Messiah? You should, because that is who he is. So as we draw to, uh, draw to a close in this, we notice three statements through prophecy drawing the attention of the hearers of Peter's message. The truth is proclaimed, it's prophesied, foreshadowed in the Old Testament, and affirmed in the New Testament. The prophecy of Joel was used to interpret and explain the gift and the truth of the Holy Spirit that was poured out for all. David's prophecy in Psalm 16 testifies to Christ's resurrection and Messiahship. Then Psalms 110 verse 1, we see the prophetic messianic application foreshadowing Jesus the Messiah and his enthronement as Lord at, uh, at God's right hand. And all of this came to fulfilling. What more can we, can we question, church? Even today as we read the Word of God, we believe and we affirm that it is the truth and that should settle it. What does this mean for us? It means that God had a plan, a plan for salvation for all who call upon the name of the Lord, for they will be saved. And that is the truth.